Stanford University. I want to uh, welcome you again, those of you uh, who were, were not here last night uh, for the dinner, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, reunion and conference. I'm very pleased to have Len Downey, uh, Leonard Downey Jr. Uh, with us this morning. He's the Vice President at Large of the Washington Post. Um, there's a lot of biographical information uh, uh, about him in your uh, program, so I'm not going to give an extensive introduction, but I will mention a couple of things. Um, he's been at the a Washington Post journalist his entire career since he started as an intern in 1964. Uh, he was executive editor from 1991 to 2008, and during that time, the Post won 25 Pulitzer Prizes. Um, he's now working on a report on the state and future of journalism for the Columbia School of Journalism, uh, which he's going to draw on as, in re remarks this morning. And beginning in the fall, he'll be teaching at the Arizona State uh, University School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Len, glad to have you with us. I'll talk for a while, and then I would be very, very happy to uh, answer your questions, which is often the people's favorite part of having me speak. Um, I want to explain a little bit about the title Vice President at Large, because you're journalists, people have been asking me about it. It's a title that was invented by Ben Bradley for Ben Bradley when he retired as executive editor, and he kindly consented to allow me to share it with him now that I've retired as executive editor. It means we don't get paid anymore because we're retired, uh, but we still have uh, offices at the Washington Post, and we're around for any chores anybody wants us to do. But mostly for me, it's been a base of operations, will be a base of operations for the work that I want to do about the future of news, both the report I'm doing for Columbia, the teaching I'll be doing part of the year at Arizona State, and other things other research and writing, and I'm also a member now of uh, the boards of three different uh, nonprofit journalism organizations. Think about how much the news and the news media have changed in just the four years since the last Knight Family Fellowship, excuse me, Knight Fellowship reunion in 2005. Not everyone was paying close attention back then, but the ground was already shifting beneath us. Newspaper circulation and television news ratings were already falling steadily while readership of news on internet websites was growing. Classified advertising was already migrating from newspapers to the web. Just a year earlier, in 2004, Google had gone public. Facebook had launched that same year, and it quickly expanded from Harvard to other college campuses and high schools. People of all ages were living much of their media lives online. Yet most newspapers, local television stations, and national television networks were still making large profits four years ago. Some reductions in newsroom staffs were being made by large chains of newspapers and television stations, primarily to maintain or grow those profits of 20 to 30 percent or more. Some chains were still buying more papers and stations, often with borrowed money, in the hopes of making even larger profits, while family and corporate owners were cashing out. Not anymore. The economic models that had sustained most of the news reporting in newspapers and on television in the United States during the last half of the 20th century are crumbling. The advertising revenue that had richly subsidized news gathering for decades is now shrinking dramatically. Many newspapers are losing money, while others are struggling to break even or make single digit profits. Many newspapers that still have a positive cash flow have owners still saddled by debts that keep them in the red. The Tribune chain, as you know, which stretches from Los Angeles to Baltimore is in bankruptcy, as are a number of smaller chains and individual newspapers. Others are for sale and are having a hard time finding buyers. The Rocky Mountain News and the Seattle Post Intelligence are disappeared, and others are likely to follow soon. More than 100 local daily newspapers that are still in existence no longer publish and deliver newspapers every day. The Detroit News and Free Press publish home delivery newspapers only three days a week. A number of smaller newspapers in Michigan and elsewhere now appear only online. The printed editions of most surviving newspapers have shrunk in size dramatically, and they contain much less news. Their news reporting staffs have been reduced by 30 to 50 percent or more. Only a handful of American newspapers still have foreign correspondents, and many no longer have news reporters covering the federal government in Washington or even the governments in their state capitals. 
Local television news staffs are shrinking too, along with their audiences and the advertising for their news shows. There's a growing number of talented, experienced journalists of a certain age who can no longer find jobs in which they can still report the news. I keep hearing about the word diaspora to describe journalists of a certain age in the United States. One could ask, as some do in the age of the internet, so what? Anyone with a computer or the right kind of handheld device like a Blackberry or a mobile phone could get news from an unlimited number of sources around the country and the world, whenever and wherever they want, in almost any form they prefer. Headlines, news stories, blogs, wikis, photos, and videos. Americans can also choose among many channels on cable and satellite television that specialize in news and opinion for target audiences, liberal or conservative politics, business or sports, news bulletins or long-winded discussions. Never in the history of mankind has so much of what looks like news been so accessible in so many ways. And besides, anyone can now commit journalism in one form or another by writing a blog, taking or transmitting a photo with an iPhone, contributing to a wiki, or tweeting on Twitter. So what's the problem? Who needs newspapers anyway? But this crisis is not about printed newspapers or who you consider to be a journalist. It's about the news. Most of the credible original news reporting in America is still produced by journalists working out of newspaper newsrooms. And then their journalism appears in varying forms, in print, on wire services, on radio and television, on websites and blogs, and on digital social networks. I do not think that printed newspapers are going to disappear entirely anytime soon, no matter what Steve Ballmer or anybody else says. About 100 million Americans still read a printed newspaper every day. More people read a printed newspaper every day than watch each night's late night, late night news on television. But that's not really the issue. Too many Americans have already been left with local newspapers whose news staffs and news content have been hollowed out, both in print and online. Those newspapers may be surviving, at least for now, but the news those, community needs, those communities need is disappearing. What is more important than the future of American newspapers is the future of professional news staffs who can produce original, independent, credible news reporting regardless of where or how it is published. Of course, there are now many millions of bloggers, freelancers, and ordinary citizens posting content on a myriad of places over the web every day, and that's a good thing. Bloggers and citizen journalists do surface information that might not otherwise come to light. And just as importantly, the blogosphere widely disseminates news that was originally produced by the staffs of newspapers and other professional news organizations. And the scrutiny by bloggers of professional news organizations and their content has made them more accountable and responsible than ever before. But bloggers and citizen journalists are only able to produce a relatively small amount of reliable original news reporting, even at the local level. And it is often buried in or distorted by the opinion and bias and trivia that dominates discourse on the internet. Original, independent, empirical, and verifiable news reporting is still best done by journalists working in professional collaboration with standards for accuracy and fairness, despite the mistakes they sometimes make. Particularly important is their ability to do the in-depth and investigative reporting that holds the powerful accountable and that exposes problems and illuminates issues so citizens can address them. We do not necessarily need newspapers to do this work, but we do need journalists and newsrooms like those of newspapers. So if American newspapers and their newsrooms continue to shrink, and if many of them disappear completely, how will that get done? That brings me to other somewhat more encouraging changes that have taken place since your last reunion here four years ago. There is now a greatly increased awareness of the crisis in American journalism. It's being covered extensively by the news media. It's being discussed all over the internet. It is the subject of numerous conferences, inquiries, and initiatives by American universities, foundations, and public interest groups. It is being debated in Congress and studied by the Obama administration. It is attracting the attention of American philanthropists and the interests of entrepreneurs who are investing in various new forms of national and local news reporting. There are new local online news sites, like The Voice of San Diego, launched in 2005. Min Post, which began in Minneapolis 18 months ago, the year-old St. Louis Beacon, the four-year-old Chi-Town Daily News in Chicago, 
The New Haven Independent created in 2006, and the Deerfield Forum, which started a year earlier in rural New Hampshire, and many others. These and other local news sites are being financed by foundation grants, corporate gifts, individual donors, and some advertising. Their staffs are still relatively small. And they are often augmented by freelancers and local citizens contributing news and commentary. Some sites are even training volunteers to do news reporting for them. These new local sites are trying to fill the gaps left by the downsizing of newspapers by targeting their resources on reporting they believe their communities most need about local government, education, the environment, and neighborhoods. They do not have the newspaper's legacy expenses of printing presses or delivery systems because they publish only on the internet. But they also do not yet have audiences or advertising bases anywhere near as large as the surviving newspapers and their websites do. Yet the Voice of San Diego, whose staff of 12 specializes in local accountability reporting, has already had a significant impact beyond the size of its million dollar budget and less than 100,000 site visitors to date, per day to date. Its revelations of fraud in local housing programs resulted in firings, criminal investigations and reforms in San Diego, and won a George Polk Award. There also are new national news sites, like the two-year-old Politico, which covers politics out of Washington, the nonprofit ProPublica, now in its second year of national investigative reporting, based in New York, and the foundation-supported Kaiser Health News, which just opened its newsroom in Washington. They put all of their reporting on their websites, but they also collaborate with established news organizations to put their stories in newspapers, on radio, television, and their websites. Within just the last few weeks, we had three stories in the Washington Post produced by a collaboration of Washington Post and ProPublica reporters. Two much older nonprofit investigative reporting organizations, the Center for Investigative Reporting at Berkeley and the Center for Public Integrity in Washington, are both expanding their missions and reach at a, and, and their missions and reach at a time when newspapers and television have less money to spend doing investigative journalism themselves. The Center for Investigative Reporting is launching a California project to produce extensive in, uh, in enterprise and investigative reporting about California and its state government. It intends to partner with news organizations throughout the state to put its reporting on as many platforms as possible. You'll hear more about that from uh, Rosenthal, Robert Rosenthal this morning. The Center for Public Integrity is expanding its database uh, investigative reporting projects on the federal government, political money, and various national issues, which it offers through collaborations and on its website to news organizations and the public. A growing number of college news services, student news services, and nonprofit investigative reporting projects affiliated with universities across the country are also starting to contribute stories to local news media. The student staff capital news service of the Philip Merrill School of Journalism at the University of Maryland offers locally oriented coverage of the federal government in Washington and the state capital in Annapolis to newspapers and radio stations in Maryland. Student journalists at Arizona State's Walter Cronkite School cover local news for Arizona newspapers and their website. Nonprofit investigative reporting projects have been started at universities including Boston University, Brandeis, Northeastern, Northwestern, Wisconsin, and Arizona State among others. Experienced newspaper reporters who have recently left newsrooms now supervise students in ambitious investigative projects that are offered free to local news media through those universities. Just last week, two dozen of these nonprofit community news and investigative reporting nonprofit sites gathered together to form the Investigative News Network so that they can collaborate on reporting, presentation, and sharing of resources. And that network is expected to grow rapidly. Places like the Knight Center for Media Entrepreneurship at Arizona State's Walter Cronkite School also are helping students develop news websites and other forms of digital journalism, some of which have attracted serious attention and startup funding. These students are excited about the future of news and their potential roles in helping to shape it, even if they are still uncertain about just where they'll be working and for how long. While displaced veteran journalists understandably focus on the destruction in the ongoing creative destruction of traditional news media, these digitally sav savvy future journalists see opportunity for creativity. Even after the current economic recession ends, we will not go back to the days of dominant American newspapers and television companies in which their news reporting was almost completely subsidized by advertising. And the hybrid economic model of the fledgling nonprofit news sites 
a combination of philanthropy, voluntary membership, and advertising, appears unlikely so far to, pursue, to support larger, more wide-ranging news organizations like newspapers. <clears throat> so the search for new models has begun, and of course it begins with the internet, where most information, including news, has been free. With very few exceptions, American newspapers either failed in attempts to charge admission to their websites or have not even tried because it's been so easy to find news, including links and references to their own news stories on so many other free places on the internet. But many newspaper owners are now studying novel new ways to charge for some or even most of their content on the web, perhaps in concert with each other. Would that require an exemption from US antitrust laws? It is, is it too late and too difficult to reverse the expectation that news on the internet will mostly be free? It's been suggested that people using the internet might pay for news one story at a time, with so-called micropayments like those for music on iTunes. But would people value news the way they do music that can be played over and over? There's also interest in ways that readers might voluntarily offer to pay for news that interested them through some kind of digital tip jar as they surf the web. How much news reporting could that finance? Some European countries provide various kinds of subsidies for their news media, and they have increased those subsidies as advertising revenues have plunged there too. But of course, they do not have the American tradition embodied in the First Amendment to the Constitution of our separation between government and the press. Of course, the federal government here has, had some, has always had some economic influence on the news media through tax and other policies. It does regulate commercial television and radio through the allocation of broadcast licenses and spectrum, and it does help subsidize public radio and television through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Should Congress create something like a national endowment for news to receive money from the government and foundations to be channeled to news organizations or used for innovation? In order to receive the money, would they have to become nonprofits like public radio and television stations and networks? And how much money would individual news organizations receive this way? In reality, only a fraction of the news budgets of public broadcasting currently comes from the federal government. The rest comes from listeners like you and other donors through incessant fundraising. And a number of bigger donations are earmarked for specific kinds of news coverage of particular interest to the donors, which can and does distort coverage. National Public Radio is one of the relatively few remaining news organizations with a large number of correspondents around the country and the world. And the audience for its daily in-depth morning and evening news shows has grown steadily over the years in contrast to the audience declines for most commercial television and radio news. But NPR's financial support, which is heavily dependent on corporate contributions, is also not keeping pace during the recession. And it too has had to cut costs. Relatively few of the membership-supported local and regional public radio stations around the country can afford sizable news staffs or new local news broadcasts of their own. Should the government greatly increase its support for public news coverage? Should we change the public broadcast system in some drastic way to meet the new exigencies? Some of the nonprofit online news startups around the country are partnering with local public radio stations to get their reporting on the air. Are public policy changes or government subsidies needed to make more of that kind of collaboration possible? There's been a lot of speculation about enabling newspapers to become nonprofits if they can be separated from their current debt burden owners and be kept alive by a combination of commercial revenue and philanthropy. United States Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland has introduced a bill that would allow newspapers to become nonprofits for educational purposes under Section 501c3 of the tax code. This could make their advertising and circulation revenue tax exempt, and charitable contributions made to them would be tax deductible for the donors. If Congress were to pass such legislation, it's not clear how a large commercial newspaper, especially one with significant debt or tax liabilities, could be easily converted into a viable nonprofit. So it's been suggested that philanthropic foundations could buy and run newspapers, or that endowments could be created to own them as nonprofit tax exempt institutions like universities or cultural institutions. But with billions needed to provide the investment income to finance just one sizable newsroom, how could foundations or endowments provide enough money for sufficiently large local news operations for communities all across the country? A few newspapers are already owned by nonprofits. The St. Petersburg Times in Florida is owned by the Pointer Institute, a journalism research and education nonprofit funded by revenue from the newspaper. 
The family that had owned the Aniston Star in Alabama joined with the University of Alabama recently to create a similar nonprofit institute to run that newspaper. Under these arrangements, however, the newspapers still must make money for their nonprofit owners to fund them. The St. Petersburg Times, for example, has had to cut staff and costs significantly and has put some of its assets, including CQ, Congressional Quarterly, up for sale. A more intriguing suggestion is that newspapers become low-profit, limited liability corporations, a new phrase I learned, or L3Cs, that's the buzzword, a newly emergent corporate structure that amounts to a for-profit business that also qualifies as a charity because it has a, quote, social purpose, unquote. Led by Vermont and Michigan, a half dozen states have passed legislation creating L3Cs for various local purposes. So far, not news. An L3C newspaper could theoretically still accept all kinds of commercial revenue, plus tax-exempt money from foundations and charities, while making a limited profit if it were legally recognized as having a social benefit. Would that require federal legislation or an IRS, IRS ruling? Philanthropic foundations are allowed by the IRS to make what's called program-related investments in nonprofit ventures considered to be doing a social good. But without clear guidelines or a process for defining such investments, foundations have been reluctant to make them without expensive case-by-case -case rulings from the IRS. So, could Congress or the IRS make clear that newspapers or other news organizations qualify as 501c3 nonprofits or L3c limited profit ent entities eligible for such investments? Or should internet service providers be required to include a fee in their monthly bills to support public service news reporting? just like we pay for HBO and our cable bills? Could the money be channeled through something like a national endowment for news that could make grants to news organizations? Some American philanthropic foundations are making those kinds of grants now to university-related and nonprofit news organizations. The Knight Foundation, Sunlight Foundation, and the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, along with some community foundations, have been funding innovative experiments in digital news as well as the startup community news and investigative reporting websites I talked about earlier. But foundations do not usually provide ongoing funding for the long term. So the hybrid models will have to evolve financially to survive and grow. Obviously, we've entered a chaotic and unpredictable time in American journalism. Technology will continue to change rapidly and dramatically, creating still more ways in which to report and present the news digitally. Social networks will continue to evolve and multiply, increasing citizen involvement in the gathering and consumption of news. Some experiments will fail, but others may survive and prosper. Existing news organizations are trying to change before it's too late. Only those able to creatively and substantially transform themselves will survive and be able to produce meaningful journalism in the future. The Washington Post provides a good case study. Our newsroom is now being completely restructured and integrated with our web operation. A universal news desk channels all news coverage to platforms ranging from the printed newspaper and its website to iPhones and Facebook pages. The news staff is being focused on subjects including local news, sports and culture, the federal government, politics, the economy, healthcare, science and technology, national security and world affairs, and of course investigative reporting which are most important to consumers of Washington Post journalism, regardless of platform. Digital initiatives include staff blogs for most beats, interactive discussions with sources and readers, RSS feeds and text alerts, photo galleries, podcasts, and videos. Think back to how much has changed in the news media in the last four years. More will change even faster in the next four. We can be bystanders to that change and lament what we've lost. Or we can find new ways to save the news in the evolving old media, in new media, and in the nonprofit and academic incubators of new forms of news. We should not leave change to new media ideologues who are hostile to professional news reporting. But we must be open to new ways to do that reporting and to share it with an increasingly involved audience. The, ch the choices for change do not have to be either or. New news media do not have to completely displace old news media. The digital world has an infinite capacity for volume and variety of forms of news. Whatever the medium, journalism does not have to give way to Babel. The most heavily trafficked news sites on the internet are still produced by professional news organizations. People do want to share and communicate with each other in digital space, and they want to know what is factual, especially when it affects their lives. 
There is danger for journalism in the on-rushing destruction of old media, and there is real opportunity for journalism in what can be created out of the chaos. Thanks. Okay, we'll start on this side. Thank you. Um, taking advantage of, of uh, your presence here specifically, one of the things that concerns us about the transition to new media is that some of the values, not simply the news gathering operations, um, will wither with the competition with the new media. And one of them is the confusion between commercial and news. You know where this is going. Right, that's fine. Um, I'd, I'd like you to comment on the recent right. uh, controversy with Weymouth. And, and specifically, a lot of us were not pleased with the fallback position, with the statement of the publisher, Catherine Weymouth, um, saying, oh, it was a mistake, and so forth, because it still relied on others do it, on um, we think it's still possible to have this kind of um, there, it's not possible to have salons in her house. That will not happen. Thank you. Uh, what is going on? It has Wait, been what is the bright light? Right. So if you yes, could yes. go into Well, we are, we're, we're establishing that now because obviously um, it was confused. Could you explain the background, please? Uh, OK. Uh, very, very quickly. Um, uh, the, the Washington Post hired somebody to help us get more active in the conference business, which has been something that the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times, The Economist, uh, the Atlantic Magazine and others have done, where they have uh, uh, sponsors uh, uh, pay for conferences that either people pay to come to, to uh, listen to or the sponsors pay for it. And it makes some money for the newspaper and it brings news sources in to talk about things and sometimes it involves the newspaper staff. And we had not done very much of, of that in the past and so the, the idea was can we do more of that in the future to help deal with our economic problems. And the, uh, the, the first ideas that came up were bad ideas. Uh, and uh, a, a, a plans were made to have salons in Catherine Graham's home that would be sponsored by individual advertisers, uh, and um, they would be off the record, and there would be news people involved in the conversations. Uh, and all of that uh, is wrong uh, and was a mistake. And uh, uh, Catherine knows that. Uh, she has apologized for it. Uh, we, we have not held any of them, which is a good thing. None of these things actually happened. It was stopped before they took place and they will not take place. And we're gonna go back and rein reinvestigate how we might participate in the conference business. More importantly, both the decision making that led to that is being internally investigated so we don't make that mistake again. And even more importantly, we're gonna come up, we're gonna be the first media organization with written guidelines for conferences and public events. Uh, and that will be useful for us and for the rest of the industry for exactly the reasons you say, we're all looking for new money and we need to make sure that the bright line is clear to us. Uh, I should say, in, uh, in response to your larger question, that I've actually been impressed that a number of the startups around the country, and these are, these are people that are desperate for money uh, to start something like the Voice of San Diego or some of these investigative reporting projects, are quite clear about their standards. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the, the separation that took place physically in the old days between the newsroom and business side, where you never talked to them, never talked to each other, that no longer can take place. So you have to know what the rules are because you gotta be able to talk to each other. So at The Voice of San Diego, you got a 12 person staff plus maybe three other people. And so the editor and the publisher, they're almost indistinguishable, Scott Lewis and Andrew, whatever his name is. Uh, and um, they both get involved in business things as well as journalistic things, but they know what their standards are and they observe them. And that's what we have to have going forward. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's exactly right. They're going to be written by the editor of the newspaper and by Milton Coleman, the deputy managing editor who has always been our conscience during his entire time at the Post. Yes. Good morning. I'm wondering, um, with the rise of blogs such as, or sites such as the Huffington Post, which right. have been immensely popular um, and which I occasionally blog for, trained as a traditional journalist, um, trained to keep my own opinion and point of view out of my journalism. Right. Um, and we're seeing this major shift toward analysis and opinion. Um, and I'm wondering, um, in your work with the Washington Post, with the blogs that your reporters are now keeping, how are you, what sort of shift are you seeing in terms of news gatherers and reporters now also doing analysis? Right. Um, and what do you see, where do you see that going and how do you see that affecting journalism? Uh, uh, obviously, analysis and opinion are enormously popular on the internet. People love to hear their own opinions and they love to hear other people's opinions that they agree with, usually. 
or sometimes they just look at them to be mad at them. But anyway, it's very, very popular on the internet. It's, it's been one of the largest increases in the traffic of WashingtonPost.com, or our opinion uh, sections. Uh, you have to keep the opinion and the news gathering separate from each other uh, on, on the site. You have to, people have to know what's opinion what's news gathering. At the same time, and reporters' blogs cannot express opinions, but there is more voice in them. Uh, and this is actually an advantage, but also a danger on the internet, in that reporters who really know what they're talking about, Chris Saliza on politics, Dan Baltz on politics at the Washington Post, Michael Wilbaugh, well, he's a columnist, that doesn't count, but other reporters who cover the sports teams in Washington. They really know, they have a lot of inside information that you used to not be able to find a way to get into a newspaper story. It wasn't part of the conventional newspaper story. And obviously blogs and other things on the internet offer that opportunity. And the idea is to allow them to have some voice, to be able to tell you what it is they know about something that doesn't fit into a news story without expressing their personal opinions or seeking certain outcomes. And that just, that goes day to day. We have some rules for it, but also it has to be day to day supervision by editors in order to make sure that they uh, follow the rules. Yes. Good morning. Um, I wonder if you could just return to your uh, statement about when the ground was shifting and the yes. industry didn't notice it. Um, what was really going on there and what can we learn from that that perhaps can help us as we try to move into whatever it is we're moving into? Right. You know, the only thing we can learn from it is to not make assumptions based on past what happened in the past. Uh, so in newsrooms, when I built our newsroom up to 900 people, because every time we wanted to do something new, I added more people because we could afford it, I assumed you know, that could always happen, and it, and it couldn't happen anymore. Now we have to set priorities. Now there's a very clear strategy for how, how resources will be used at the Washington Post, and there's some things we're not going to do anymore in the newspaper because we can't. It would be nice if we could. We still would if we could, but we can't. So you can't base your assumptions about what's going to happen in the future and what happened in the past. Um, secondly, uh, uh, you know, you know, everything's going to constantly change digitally in terms of the delivery of news uh, and, and also how you report the news. And uh, that was not understood by newsrooms before. Newsrooms were very hostile to the internet. When we began our internet site at WashingtonPost.com, the majority of the people in our newsroom hated the internet. They thought it was a terrible competitor. They didn't understand it. And if they had been in charge of the internet site, it would have been a flop, as many were. They were run by newspapers. So instead, we kept them separate. But then there came a time when the newsroom became webby. It was the only way you could report the news was to have your own BlackBerry and your own, you know, your own email and your own all, all sorts of things that were webby. And they were good ideas about how uh, we could uh, enhance our website. And the communication between the newsroom and the website wasn't very good because they were separate entities competing with each other. So then it was time to put them together. And if you, if you, we, we spent too long waiting to do, to do that integration based, again, on assumptions about how things had worked up until then. And so as we move forward, we, we just have to be open to newer ideas and acting on them very fast. That's the other thing. I, I recall so many times when we started new sections at the paper over the years, it would be months of research, you know, studying what the audience is interested in, studying what we're good at, what it is we want to do as journalists. Is this going to work for advertising? Will it work for circulation? Even if it doesn't work for them, will we do it anyway? Then we start it. And once you start it, it's part of the newspaper. It's never going to go away. That was our assumption. Uh, and that's the internet's not like that. The internet, you can start something tomorrow. If you don't like it, take it off next week or change it drastically. Uh, and so we're, our time frame for innovation has to be much, much tighter than it was before. And lastly, there was the business side assumption that defending, uh, Warren Buffett has a phrase for this, I can't remember anymore, but essentially defending your turf. In other words, protecting all of your newspaper print advertising, no matter what, was what was driving all the newspaper companies at a time when something else was going on, uh, and, and defending those very large profits, which you had to, Wall Street was insisting on, were terrible mistakes, and, and the industry lost years of innovation as a result. Yes? Len, I, I, read, your, I read your novel. And Good for you. <laughs> You'll well, tell everybody how much you like it now? Well, I found it entertaining, but I was disturbed by one thing. Um, she wasn't fired. No, that okay. you created a main character, yes. a young female reporter who slept with her source. And, and she wasn't fired. <laughs> and I wanted to hear, you know, why you went down that path. And <laughs> <clears throat> um, first of all, I know of a number of journalists who have had that temptation or even that actuality occur, both male and female. And so I wasn't going to shy away from that. Uh, that is a constant tension. There, the, the novel deals with many of the constant tensions in journalism. 
and particularly tensions between sources and reporters. And that's only one of them. There are a lot of other tensions between sources and reporters in Novel Explorers. I wanted my main characters to be women because very little of what's been done in fiction or in movies about journalism has women main characters. The reporters are usually men. And the president's usually a man, so I have a woman president and I have a woman reporter, a woman managing editor. And then they behave like journalists behave, uh, including the, you know, the pluses and the minuses of it. Um, I am upbraided sometimes by some of my good friends in the business for not having fired this person in the novel. And I'm asked if she was working in the Washington Post whether we were fired or not. And my answer is, I don't know, but this is fiction. It was, didn't occur in the Washington Post. <laughs> yes? Concerned about legal protection for journalists and new media, yes. and I think that you know one of the great things about working for a newspaper was that you had that um, legal department that could um, right. help you with very litigious sources. Yes. So, are you aware of like the Voice of San Diego or uh, some of these university operations? Right. Because also now that I work at a university, I see that many of the journalists of a certain age who are joining universities are usually adjunct professors, so they're not even, um, they don't have tenure, and they're a little more pre precarious in their right. um, situation. Right. Do any of these have either legal departments or, or anything that would... Uh, yeah, this is a high priority for the movement, and uh, what most of them have done so far is found pro bono legal help. People in their community, lawyers in their community who care about the news, who understand this problem, they say, I'll work for you for free or for very little money, relatively small retainer, and whatever it is you need from me, I'm going to do for you, including defending you if you're getting a libel suit. Uh, but that's, that's not enough for the long term. So that's one of the reasons why the Investigative News Network was formed, with, I, I think, two weeks ago now. Uh, and, and to find ways in which they can join together to provide legal help to get libel insurance as a group, to get group health insurance even. All the things that you, that you just associate with a large news organization that they need. So by banding together, they hope to do that. That's also why some of these organizations have started within universities so that they can use the university's overhead and the university's protection. On the other hand, I apologize to Stanford, you also get the university bureaucracy and slow moving decision making. And so some of them have affiliated partly with the university but not really part of the university. So all that's being explored, it's a very real issue. Yes. I work at um, WNYC in New York, public radio, and um, I, I, I'm wondering what you think about the appropriateness. I mean, you mentioned that there's a sort of, you know, thoughts about creating a national foundation for news, national yes. foundation for news. Well, you think it's a good <clears throat> idea, and I say this because. You know, I sort of think like, you know, one of the things when we go out, lots of us, we train young journalists, and we say, we talk about how fundamental journalism is to democracy and to right. keeping government honest. Right. And, and, and I wonder whether it's such a, you know, we should allow such an essential part of our democratic system be something that is handled through the regular, you know, sort of right. capitalist <laughs> enterprise. And, right. You know, and, and I say this with a, I mean, I came to work at WNYC when the station was owned by the city of New York. And uh, as a matter of fact, the reason that I did was because um, Giuliani, who was the mayor at the time, insisted that the guardian angel, Curtis Lee, would get a, get a show on public radio. And uh, they brought in a, a series of co-hosts to sort of be the voice of sanity. I, I was one of them. And that's how I started. So I'm very sensitive to, you know, sort of what can happen in that yes. model. And yet... Given what's happening now, I wonder if maybe it shouldn't be something that we should be a little less worried about. Right. Uh, I think the answer to the, to the final question at the end is uh, yes, we should be a little less worried about it. I think that the future is going to require um, mixed, a mixed economy, if you will, for journalism, and much more collaboration in journalism. It's already starting to take place. So a lot of collaboration with nonprofits and for profits, and even government subsidized things and for profits. Um, obviously, in dealing with government subsidies, you've got to have protections. I, I think the current CPB is still flawed in that regard. It's still a politically appointed board. It is sometimes a politically swayed board. Certainly, people in public television feel that they have to be careful about what they say and do uh, because of the political influence. Um, so I, I, my model for thinking about this, I've not arrived at a final decision yet, but my model for thinking about this is National Science Foundation which does uh, uh, competitive, peer-reviewed, completely transparent process grants uh, for uh, scientific exploration at universities all across the country. 
uh, and that's money that comes from the government. But it doesn't feel like that to the scientists or to the universities because of the way the process is handled outside government and outside, process, outside politics. It's just government money. So that's one thing to look at, but we're exploring that. Yes, sir. Um, I've got a real softball for you, but I'm curious. You've had a long and distinguished career. I'd just like to reflect on it a little bit and tell us what are you proudest of in your 40 plus years, either a story or an episode? Right. Um, well, it's hard to get past Watergate, obviously, um, which I was, uh, I was a relatively young editor then uh, that uh, started working on that story when I was the editor of the Senate Watergate hearing uh, coverage, uh, and then eventually became Bob and Carl's editor for the last roughly half of uh, the Watergate saga before Richard Nixon resigned. So that's. You know, that's, uh, that's, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, that, it's hard to get beyond that. Um, what I'm really proudest of is sitting over here, Jeff Lane. I am proud of a tradition now that we've established at the Washington Post, beginning with Watergate, in which investigative reporting is in our DNA, in which we're one of the leaders in the country and always will be, no matter what else happens to our economic model, no matter what else we have to do with the newspaper, which is why we were so concerned about what happened with the salon business, because we don't want to tarnish that reputation or have people misunderstand what we're about. We are about accountability reporting at the Washington Post. And uh, that's what I'm most proud of, is that we have a, we have a, uh, we have a tradition now that's not going to go away. More, a majority of the 25 Pulitzer Prizes won when I was executive editor were for investigative reporting. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Since you were such a young man when that story broke, did you ever during that period say, I'll never get another one like this? <laughs> we, had, we had absolutely no uh, self um, introspection during that time. We, we didn't understand what we were in the middle of. We understood we were in the middle of a very high, tense, important investigation. We were worried. Remember, you remember, uh, and nobody believed us at the outset, including our own national reporting staff. Uh, there was tremendous pressure from the Nixon administration to stop doing it. The tel licenses of Mrs. Graham's television chase stations were challenged. We had just gone public and the stock went way down initially. Um, somebody tried to sell Carl Bernstein marijuana three blocks away from the White House. I mean, it was, it was and we were afraid of making a mistake. So, it, and, and we were working around the clock. It was crazy. Uh, so uh, we were just focused on the next step forward. So on the night that <clears throat> Nixon resigned, when the national staff finally got the story, because it's now a political story, Bob and Carl and I and others that were involved in that coverage uh, just sat numb in the newsroom and didn't do any work because we really didn't know that's what, how this was going to end. We just never allowed ourselves to think that. Yes, sir. Moving from the Washington Post and Watergate and WNYC to Port Towns in Washington here. Uh, Good. Uh, in my post-daily career, I do some work for the local weekly, but locally owned, about 12,000 circulation. And my understanding is they're doing well. There's, their revenues yeah. are down, but their circulation is staying solid. They're right. still, and they're not losing money. And my understanding is that's true of a lot of weeklies around the country. Yes, weeklies well, and some of the smaller dailies because they don't have internet competition, at least not yet. I mean, there are, there are internet sites springing up. But are there like any lessons there for, for, the, for the dailies? No, I'm afraid not, uh, because it's just a totally different scale. I mean, uh, uh, you, 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 you exist in a protected harbor, if you will. There's no internet sites. You're not competing on national news with anybody else. Uh, by and large, your classified advertising is, you know, Craigslist is not going to be a competitor for classifieds in a weekly or, or small community daily. Uh, so for a while, at least, that's a safe harbor. It's, it's still, expenses are going up and revenue's not going up. And there are, there are, uh, and there are some companies that bought a lot of community newspapers with a lot of debt, and they are in trouble. I think one is, in fact, in bankruptcy. So if you made that mistake, it, you aren't protected by the fact that you're in this safer area. But that is, a, that is a better business to be in right now than a Metropolitan Daily. Yes? Um, I wondered if you would tell us, uh, Jim mentioned you were on the board of three nonprofit news organizations. Yeah. I wondered if you would tell us which ones. And mm -hmm. then also, um, from your research, are any of the university experiments involving business school students? Uh, or do you think the, the profit-making model is just 
gone, gone, gone. No, no. I, it, all innovation of all kinds is necessary, and I, and in fact. Um, uh, some places, some of the journalism schools that are on the cutting edge of innovation are working with their business schools, are working with their schools of engineering on, uh, you know, digital engineering and so on. And um, one of the things I want to explore is how extensively universities should get involved now in the news. You know, they're involved in a lot of other aspects of scientific development, business development, cultural development. Um, I think they have a responsibility to be involved in news development. And I, I should say here, it's not part of the report I'm going to be doing, but I should say here I'm very disappointed with universities who's, who have not allowed or, uh, or, anyway, disappointed with journalism schools that are not moving in that direction. Journalism schools that are, like my alma mater at Ohio State, that are focused on public relations and advertising and uh, research about journalism and not doing anything about the future of but news. But is there anybody out there who you think is a model? Because that's the thing, honestly, that there's not that it's developing. It's developing. Obviously, I'm going to Cronkite to teach there because I think that is one of the models. I think Columbia is a model in a different way. Uh, and uh, I'm interested in things that are going on at Stanford, the, the new, the new uh, um, it's a master's or PhD program here that's doing very innovative things. What, uh, what the Knight Fellowship's going to do now is, is headed in the right direction. It's, it's an innovator. So there's no single model. There are a lot of innovation. We're really back to where uh, a time a long time ago, the turn of the century, when there were 10, 20 newspapers in a city, and you didn't know which one was going to be the New York Times you know, in, the, in the 50 years. And that's, that's what's happening now. There's a lot of things starting up. To go back to the beginning, of your question on the Board of Investigative Reporters and Editors, Inc., which I helped found in 1970, whatever it was, five, uh, and uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting, which Robert Rosenthal will be talking about this morning, and um, the Kaiser Health News uh, in Washington. Yes? I'm grateful for my job at MinPost, <coughs> but I would like to know how confident you are that the profession can be sustainable to individual journalists again. I mean, this is only a slight exaggeration, but I mean, what's happened to, if we think of this as a profession, what's happened is sort of like, what if lawyers and doctors suddenly made $15,000 a right. year? Well, and what would happen right. to that? Remember, we're not practice. lawyers and doctors. Yeah. Uh, and until, until roughly the 1960s or 70s, uh, very few of us even thought we might be in that same category. Uh, it was a scruffy profession. Uh, salaries were low. People did it because they loved it. Uh, and they often didn't stay in it for a career. They would be there for a while, and they'd go off and do something else. And we may be going back to that time. And that's, what the, young, that's the way the young people are thinking about it. They're, th they're seeing this exciting ecosphere, of this digital ecosphere, in which there's all kinds of opportunity. They're not thinking about where I'm going to be in 40 years. Uh, and that may, that may be unfortunate, but that's the change that's taken place. We are not doctors and lawyers. This, we have professional standards, but we don't have a protected profession in that, in that regard. And, and as a result, there are people that are suffering. There, there's a certain, as I said earlier in my speech, you know, there's a group of people of a certain age, journalists of a certain age, who are getting squeezed in this, just like auto workers and other people. And I'm afraid I don't, I don't know how, how that's going to work out. Some are becoming academics, some are moving to other professions, but they're not necessarily going to have jobs in news anymore. It's sad. Yes? Uh, a simple question. Should readers, <clears throat> should readers pay for their online news, and will they? Um, somebody should pay for online news, and maybe it's the readers. But that's not the history of the internet. There are other ways. There are other put, play, there, are, uh, there are other ways. I'm sorry. There are other ways in which users of online news could pay through the intermediaries who present them the online news, and that may be the way to do it rather than charging the readers directly. Like cable TV packaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like uh, internet service providers and others uh, doing that. But there also are some really interesting technological opportunities that are coming up that may make it. For, there, there are two things you can't do. You can't say that you're forcing readers to pay for the news. They're going to revolt. And I, I know there's some journalistic organizations that are still interested in doing that. I think if they do, it'll be a mistake. It'll greatly cut, cut down on their uh, audiences on the internet and any possibility they have for advertising revenue and transaction revenue in the future. Plus, I always think that keeping news from people is immoral. That's just my feeling. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, you can't uh, make it, um, you know, you can't make it bothersome. Yeah, how, how many times do I, every time I use a new computer in a hotel around the country to access WashingtonPost.com, I have to register that computer in my name in order to be on WashingtonPost.com. They're not charging me anything, but boy, does it piss me off every time I have to do it. It takes, what, 10 seconds maybe? I have to remember that password again, but it just irritates me. And the internet provides opportunities to not have that bother. And so people are looking at technological ways in which you may be, you may be able to pay in relatively painless ways, but that's still, that's still in the development stage. Yes. 
Hi. Uh, part of the uh, problem, it seems to me, is that we've lost part of our audience. And part of the reason is that newspapers are either boring or they're un understandable, they're mysterious. And I wonder, I guess my question is, please discuss. <laughs> <laughs> um, the audience for news, I was talking about this at breakfast with a couple of folks that are here. The audience for news is bigger and better than ever. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dispersed audience for dispersed news uh, uh, dissemination. And yes, a lot of newspapers have forfeited part of their audience by the way in which they've maximize profits and minimize news and become boring. Uh, but that's not, this, that's not the essential problem. I, you, your question, though, did remind me of something I didn't mention in the speech, which is another interesting development, which is there's a new news literacy movement starting. Uh, it grows out of, uh, out of um, um, St uh, Stony Brook uh, University on Long Island and a guy named Alan Miller in Washington. Two different news literacy projects. One for middle and high school students is the one that's growing up out of Washington, and college students is the one that's growing up out of Stony Brook. And I have high hopes for these. And what, what the object there is not to convince people, to, young people, to read newspapers. It is, to, it is to help them understand how to get and process news from wherever it comes from so that they will be a, a, an engaged, intelligent news audience. And then that will force us to give them the news that they deserve. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.